Hello everyone. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about how the web as a platform came from a place where JavaScript didn't even yet exist to our modern day applications where we're sending in many cases an order of magnitude more JavaScript than necessary. I'll be looking at how we can reduce that amount of JavaScript. We'll also be comparing the multi-page app and single page app architectures. And then finally, we'll go into how modern tooling allows us to use either architectural style without compromising the developer experience, including tools like Vite. My name is Dylan Piercy, and I've been working at eBay for the past five years on their Web Foundations team, responsible for various parts of the eBay front-end ecosystem. One of the main projects that I work on is a tool called Marco, which is our open source front-end framework. I think by the end of the presentation, you'll find out that it has some unique superpowers that I hope you find interesting. You can find me on Twitter at Dylan underscore Piercy, and I'm on GitHub as Dylan Piercy. So I've only got 20 minutes, so I'll try and be fast. As you can see here, the amount of JavaScript we've been including on our pages has been steadily increasing ever since we started measuring it. Up until August 2022, where the median web page is sending 500 compressed kilobytes of JavaScript. That's literally megabytes of JavaScript. And so how did we get to this point where we're sending so much JavaScript? And how might we curb our JavaScript usage in the future? 1993 is when we first see the HTML 1.0 specification we also see one of the first popular browsers, Mosaic. So what did HTML look like at this point in time? Well, for some reason, people were using uppercase tag names, and I don't know why. There's also no divs or spans or a lot of things that you might be accustomed to today. But importantly, there was two critical features that we still use and recommend today. That is links and forms. So in the beginning, HTML was really a document viewer with the ability to navigate between documents and the ability to submit information to a server. And so with that, Pretty much immediately, people were using server-side rendering to generate HTML, and they would use different technologies for this. One of the earliest technologies that was built for this use case was PHP, which came in 1994. But there was a lot of technologies people were using to generate HTML at the time, including Perl, C++, and so on. In this case, we're seeing a PHP application that is able to request data from a database and interpolate in some dynamic content for our users. And this was really powerful at the time. You could generate and build a lot of types of applications with this. Moving on to 1995, a challenger arises. We see JavaScript for the first time, and it's recommended as a tool to enhance an existing HTML application. For example, one of the recommendations was to use it to enhance forms so that you could show error messages earlier. But people use it for more nefarious things as well, like showing flashing pop-ups and like scrolling banners, you know, things reminiscent of that 90s era. But at the same time, people did want to deliver rich applications and 3D GUIs and you name it. They wanted to deliver all that to the browser just like we do today. And so there was other tools. There was Flash, there was Java applets, um, there was ActiveX. So many tools popped up at around this 1995 onto 1996 era. But these tools often weren't recommended for building sites. And the reasons might sound familiar to you. They broke the back button, they made the page take longer to load, they caused accessibility issues, they required a specific environment in which to run, you had to be on the latest version of everything, and so they had their issues. Um, but nonetheless, we would see JavaScript continue to develop, and on into 2005 and 6, we see a big change in the JavaScript ecosystem. We see jQuery for the first time with its catchy slogan, New Wave JavaScript. Obviously, that wouldn't stick, much like its logo here, but jQuery would go on to make it much easier and lower the barrier of entry for writing JavaScript and cross-compatible browser code. And so with this, people inevitably wrote more and more JavaScript. Another big change at the time is that Ajax was gaining steam. Even though Ajax had been supported since the early 2000s, at this point, it was really gaining popularity. And this was just another area where JavaScript was able to do more and more alongside the platform, and people were wanting to, inevitably, write more and more JavaScript. But still, the recommendation and a lot of apps were primarily server rendered with a sprinkling of jQuery, Ajax, and so on. 2010 to 2012 is another important time period for JavaScript on the web. We see a lot more JavaScript being written and tools to make it easier. One of these tools is underscore JS, which was like the missing standard library for JavaScript. At the time, browsers didn't even properly support array.map, so this was a needed, needed feature. And this tool also worked with Node.js, which would be released the year previous. Another big thing at this time was Browserify, which piggybacked on Node's CommonJS format for loading modules and allowed you to bundle those up into something that could be distributed to the browser in an efficient way. This meant that we could build larger and larger JavaScript applications and not totally suffer from the performance pitfalls of doing so. Another important tool at the time 
was AngularJS, which is one of the first popular client-side rendering technologies. I actually wanted to go back and show you the iconic two-way binding input to a div translation that they had in their demos at the time. And so I went to the Wayback Machine to look at their old, old docs. And what do you know, the JavaScript doesn't work anymore. And so we see this mix of HTML and template code, which if you've worked with Angular at the time, this might look a little bit familiar. Um, but I do think it highlights a point that JavaScript is a little bit more fragile than the HTML that it's built on top of. Finally, 2013 to 14 was another big year for JavaScript. We see one of the most iconic frameworks in the JavaScript world, React. And React brought with it so many great things that I don't want to discredit it at all in this presentation. However, React also brought with it, and in some cases this is good, the mentality that JavaScript is totally capable of delivering a performant user experience that is rendered in the browser. And so pretty much immediately we see tools pop up on top of React, like React Router, that does everything in the browser. We see the routing go to the browser, we see data fetching go to the browser with Ajax, and so much more. All of these utilities, once shared with the server, are now exclusively in the browser. And so now the cat's out of the bag, our entire applications are sent to the browser. And instead of our applications scaling with the interactivity that is within them, instead they scale with the size of our applications. And partly that's why we have so much JavaScript today. So was React the right fit for all applications? Or is there a different approach that can maintain the same DX that we can also look at? Let's rewind a little and look at a bit of a different trajectory. Specifically, let's look at eBay and its front-end ecosystem through a similar period. eBay is a really interesting company to look at here because it was founded so early. Actually, the first eBay website called Auction Web at the time was released in 1995. And it amazes me that you could build the core eBay product back then in a time without JavaScript. And so what did the eBay tech stack look like at this time? Well, to generate the HTML, they used Perl. Although quickly they discovered that Perl wasn't going to scale with their growing user base. And so they looked for faster technologies on the server and switched to C++ eventually in 1998 and beyond. C++ was great for performance, but it was hard to maintain. And so developer productivity and velocity suffered. And eventually, eBay made the switch in 2004 to a Java-based stack, which alleviated some of the issues. However, with the growing popularity of JavaScript and the clear demonstrations that client-side rendering could have benefits and had a great DX, eBay was interested if we could build a platform that was better, something that was unified. Because with Java, it wasn't just one application, it was two. It was Java and jQuery. And so that moves us into Node.js. Node.js, although it was released in 2009, eBay was taking a serious look at in 2012. Node.js was great because it allowed us to run performant JavaScript code in our server side. So what if we could, instead of using Java, use a consistent language from front end all the way to our back end? And this is exactly what Node enabled. However, looking at technology at the time left some to be desired. There was a big push, as I said, to client side rendering. And we knew that client-side rendering was going to require heaps and heaps of JavaScript. And we couldn't make this transition without matching the performance of our existing outgoing Java application. And so we had to look at something else. So we felt Node was just right, but it needed a little bit of investment. And so a framework is born, Marco.js. At the time, Marco was actually bundled in with a set of JavaScript utilities called Raptor templates. However, it quickly became the way that we authored most eBay applications. And so what did Marco offer? Well, obviously one of the main goals before its inception was the ability to have a consistent experience across the server and browser. And so it delivered a way to describe your templates a lot like you would in a modern client-side framework. You could set up states, you could set up event handlers, all in a single format. Beyond that though, Marco had to meet eBay's needs. It had to be fast on the server. Here I'm showing a benchmark that was recently done by the Builder.io team. They built a really awesome tool called Mitosis that I recommend you check out. It essentially takes a consistent format and compiles it to a bunch of different frameworks. And so they were able to build an application using this framework and compile it to Marco, Svelte, React, and then actually benchmark it. And then they went ahead and benchmarked the throughput of all of these applications. And they found that the Marco application was significantly faster. But this is only one piece of the performance puzzle. We needed to make sure that this raw server-side rendering performance was good. But another big piece is streaming. Streaming has gained a lot of popularity recently, especially since React has come out with suspense on the server. However, Marco has had this feature since 2012, since its inception. The idea being that if you have services that your HTML rendering requires, 
some data fetching, some database calls, things like that. We don't want the application to be as slow as the lowest common denominator. With a traditional buffered rendering approach where you do all of this processing and then you send all the HTML to the browser, essentially the browser is sitting there waiting while all this processing is happening. Instead with streaming, we're able to send as much HTML as possible to the browser and so it can actually begin doing work earlier, like downloading those critical script and style and image assets. And so this not only made it so that the page got delivered to the user more quickly, they could see information sooner, it also meant that the page as a whole completed its download earlier. And so it was just a win-win for us. Another key piece of the Marco story is what we call partial hydration. If you think back to the Java application that we were competing with at the time, it was operating under the sprinkling of JavaScript model, and so sending a lot less JavaScript than we might in a modern spa. How are we going to compete with that with our new framework? And so Marco from the beginning was designed to have server rendering be the default with opt-in JavaScript where the interactivity was needed. And we called this partial hydration. Nowadays, it might be referred to as islands architecture or similar. It's growing in popularity and we think that's great. And this allowed us to have client side rendering in the places where it benefited us and keep as much on the server as possible so that we could have minimal JavaScript sent to the browser. And this has a huge impact. On the left, you can see that there is a page that is traditionally hydrated, a spa, essentially. You can see that the entire application has to re-render in order for it to become interactive. Whereas in a Marco application, only the interactive pieces need to have their code downloaded and executed in order to become interactive. And the savings we get from this technique are significant. A few years ago, we ran an experiment where we turned off partial hydration for some of our popular pages. And we saw as much as two times to six times more JavaScript when partial hydration was turned off. Hundreds of kilobytes of JavaScript were saved. And obviously, that has an impact on our end user performance. Thankfully, Marco is not the only framework that's looking into these types of optimizations. Since 2020, we've actually seen a huge number of frameworks pop up with islands-based architecture as their focus, crazy progressive loading, and so on. And so we're super excited to see where things are going here. Now, one thing that's interesting, and this brings me into part two of the presentation, is why is there so many new frameworks in 2020? And I think it actually, in small part, is due to Vite. So obviously, in the beginning, Marco didn't recommend using Vite because, well, didn't exist yet. But Vite is a great bundler and development tool today for building these types of applications. And we have experience building in lots of different bundlers. Actually, the Marco team built its own bundler a while back called Lasso, which in some ways worked similar to Vite, although it's quite dated at this point. We also built integrations with Webpack, Rollup, and so on. But all of these tools we felt were lacking. They did not make it easy for us to build the type of experience that we needed to build. And part of that is because when you're building an optimized modern multi-page app, you want to have full control over the JavaScript entry points. It's not a single entry point. You want to have control over the CSS assets. You want to have control over the server to make things consistent. Firstly, Vite is the first bundler I've seen that has first class built-in support for server-side rendering. This is obviously huge for us because server-side rendering is obviously a key piece of Marco. And Vite makes it easy. You can just load modules directly into a development server that supports hot module reloading and more, and it just works seamlessly with the browser code as well. Vite also offers, and this is critical, a flexible development server. You can take Vite's dev server and embed it into an existing application. This makes Vite a great base for building meta frameworks, even though it's already kind of a meta framework itself. Another great thing about Vite is that it has minimal config compared to the competition. Here, I wanted to show what the same Marco example project looks like configured with Vite versus Webpack. In the Vite config, it's essentially install the Marco plugin, and the defaults are sane enough that you can just have a production application with 10 lines of configuration. Whereas in a Webpack project, well, there's a lot more. It's almost 150 lines of configuration. And that's because Webpack by default doesn't support server rendering. We need a plugin for that. Doesn't come with CSS out of the box. Doesn't come with so many things that you need to actually optimize, build, and develop a modern front-end application. And so a lot of configuration is needed. This configuration burdens the users of the framework, and it also makes building meta frameworks on top of it harder. Vite makes it easy to hook into all of the different underlying tools in a way that makes sense. Part of what makes Vite great is that it brings many tools into one. It's a Node.js hot reloader that automatically transpiles your files. 
It is a JavaScript bundler that sends only code necessary to the browser and bundles things on the fly. It is also an optimizing bundler so that your development environments start super fast. And then finally, it can bundle your application for production, optimizing images, JavaScript, CSS, the whole thing, everything you need for your application is included. And this makes things so much easier and cohesive for developers. Another awesome thing about Vite, and I can't give this enough credit, is that they have an awesome community and set of maintainers. Vite actively works with different framework authors to ensure that their integrations work seamlessly. Vite actually has an ecosystem CI where they will run changes they make against ecosystem projects. For example, our Marco plugin. Whenever they release a change to Vite, they will automatically run our test suite. And the same is true of bigger projects like SvelteKit and so on. This is huge and it allows us to continue to move faster and build these awesome developer experiences. Now, obviously, Vite isn't the sole reason for this rebirth of multi-page app and islands-based architecture frameworks. However, I believe it has helped greatly here. It has dramatically lowered the bar for building these types of experiences where you have to consider the server and the browser. You have to look at how you optimize between the two, and you have to deliver an excellent developer experience as well. And Vite delivers on that. And so I want to say thank you to the Vite team who have been so helpful in helping us integrate with Vite and many others and for delivering such a great product. And I want to leave you with this. If the next project you're building is a document that you can navigate around and submit some data to a server, well, maybe you don't need that single page application and all the JavaScript that comes with it. Thank you.